It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of assembling ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning what we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Galatians 6, 11. If I start glowing up here, it's not from the Spirit, it's from lightning. Galatians 6, 11. Look now. That's actually how it should be translated. So the Apostle Paul, this is his final instructions to the Galatians and the benediction. This will wrap up Galatians. We'll wrap it up today. I hope. Look now with what large letters I have written. Now this is an epistolary aorist. An epistolary aorist. That's E P I S. T-O-L-A-R-Y Epistolary And this describes as past tense what is present at the moment What this means is the Apostle Paul is presently writing this with his own hand And he anticipates that they will get it in the future Therefore past tense As they will receive it after he's written it An epistolary aorist Look now with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Now he was so upset with the legalist that he couldn't wait to write this down. He did not want to dictate it to someone. He didn't want to round up someone and say, here, write down what I'm thinking. He just took a piece of paper and he started writing by himself right then. He didn't want to waste any time. He was so upset over what these legalists were doing to the Galatian church. And out of his pen came sarcasm and fire, as we've noted. So, why did he write with large letters? Well, because Paul's eyes were bad. He couldn't see, so he had to write with large letters in order to even see what he was writing. And that was part of his handicap, noted in Galatians 4.15. We went over that earlier. So the principle behind this is that Paul does have a handicap. He has eye trouble. And eye trouble usually makes people very miserable, very disenchanted. And if you can't see, you, you usually go into a depression for a time. And it's understandable. But here's Paul with his handicap. He had been able to see up until this point. Now he has some eye trouble. He picked up some eye disease on the way to Galatia. And there is no handicap in human life that can hinder one from executing the unique spiritual life, and that's the principle. There is no handicap that can hinder one from executing the unique spiritual life. In spite of all handicaps, Paul carries on in his ministry. And Paul had a lot of handicaps, not just the one of eye trouble. Paul had a high, squeaky voice. Paul was bald, Paul was short, Paul was fat, as uh, described in Acts of um, uh, the, the, uh, the Acts, uh, a different Acts written by someone else, an extra bib biblical source, but uh, probably pretty accurate. So Paul carries on with his ministry. So this very letter is a monument to a man who carries on in spite of a handicap. So what he's handicapped? So do not become discouraged if you have a handicap. I don't recognize any handicap among you, but if you have a handicap, don't let it discourage you. You have a handicap because God gave you that handicap for a purpose. And you may not have a handicap today, but tomorrow you may. You may have a car accident and end up with all types of handicaps. You may get a disease and end up with a handicap. Take it as God's will. And God still has a purpose for your life as long as you're breathing. And Paul is nearly blind, yet he's still teaching. He's still studying, and he's still teaching. 
And he doesn't let this handicap get in his way because he knew God still has a purpose for his life. And boy, did God ever. He had the greatest purpose ever for one man, the Apostle Paul. So if you have a handicap and you're still living, you are to execute the spiritual life with that handicap. You're not to go to a faith healer, some phony, because when you do so, you are insulting God and His purpose for your life. If you end up with a handicap and the doctors can't uh, solve the problem, forget it. That's God's purpose for your life. But if you do have a handicap and a doctor can help you out, definitely get helped out in that area. But don't go to a faith healer. That's voodoo. And Christianity was never developed for voodoo. And there's a lot of pastors out there, so-called pastors, who have replaced the spiritual life with a bunch of voodoo. Pray on this napkin. Pray on this uh, 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 piece of paper or this uh, piece of this sheet that I send you. Pray on this. Pray on that. Come up here and get bopped on the head. We will heal you of your handicap. And that's incorrect. That's voodooism. You might as well go down to Haiti and have some a voodoo woman uh, prick a doll with a pen and then pull it out and say, there goes your disease. It's a bunch of voodooism. And that's not Christianity. Galatians 6.12 Those who desire... Now these, this is referring back to the legalistic crowd of the Jews. Those who desire... And this means from their emotions... Those who desire from their emotions to make a good showing in external matters keep compelling you to be circumcised only to avoid being persecuted, persecuted for the cross of Christ. Let's first of all, let's first of all start off with the first half of Galatians 6:12. Those legalistic Jews who desire from their emotions to make a good showing in external matters. What's that mean to make a good showing in external matters? This means that all of these legalists are playing spiritual king of the mountain. They want to be the king of the mountain. And what they would do is say, Well, now, how many of you have been circumcised today? Raise your hand or come forward. And a great number would raise their hand and come forward because they were duped into getting circumcised. And then they would say, Well, isn't this man great? Let him give a testimony about how he was circumcised. Then some man from the Galatian church would get up and give a testimony about how wonderful it was that he got circumcised. Not that he had believed in Christ, but that he had been circumcised. All of which evil part of energy of the flesh. So they wanted to make a good impression in the flesh. And today uh, we would bring it down to uh, people would say to you, well how many people did you witness to today? And you would say, well, I witnessed to 35. And then somebody else would stand up and give a testimony. Oh, yeah? Well, I witnessed to 50. And then somebody else would get up and lie and say, well, I witnessed to 100. Everybody trying to play spiritual king of the mountain. And they even do that when they start giving. And uh, I've been to a church before. It's a so-called church, not really a church. It's a place of blasphemy. And, they, and the, the pastor would get up and say, The Lord has laid it on my heart that we will receive $2,000 today. Now, how many of you want to give money? Raise your hand and state the amount. And they would go through and one person would raise their hand and say, I give you 50 bucks. And the preacher would say, Good for you, brother. You've done a great thing. And then somebody else would raise their hand. Well, I'll give you 100. And then they start competing. And that's not spirituality. That's a bunch of nonsense. And the Lord laid it on, him, on his heart to get 2,000. He ended up with 3,000, but he had an answer for that too, of course. He said, well, did the Lord lay it on your heart for two or 3,000? Which is it? Well, superabundance, amen, amen. So this very letter is a monument uh, to the fact that uh, Paul is against all of this junk and the reason why churches put up on a board how many members showed up today. I went to one church once and they had, to, well, one day there were 12, one day there were five, and they would write it out every day. But what's that matter? You see, they're in competition and they want to make a good showing in the flesh. What's a good showing in the flesh? Friend day. That's a good showing in the flesh. We get a lot of people in on friend day. We'll have a great showing of what? A bunch of flesh. A bunch of people who don't give anything 
any... They don't give a damn about the Word of God, but they do give a damn about social life, and so they come to this church, not this one, that one over there, on Friend Day. Why? A great showing of the flesh, and then after Friend Day, they'll brag about it. We had 5,000 members. We had 1,000 new people show up. Amen, they'll say. Why? Well, they want to make a good showing in the flesh. And they're not making any showing to God. God is disgusted with that type of stuff. And if God could frown, He would frown at that type of stuff. That's not advancing anyone spiritually. You're trying to run a business instead of a church. If I were to run a business, it would be different. But we're not here to run a business and turn over a profit. We're here to learn the Word of God and turn over an invisible profit. One that can only be seen by God and not by others. But people get into approbation lust and they want to be known as the greatest pastor ever and they want to get up and be known as the greatest public speaker ever so that they can make a good showing of it and make a good showing of people and it's disgusting and it was disgusting for Paul and he makes it clear to them. Those who desire from their emotions to make a good showing in external matters, they keep compelling you to be circumcised only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. So why are they doing this? Well, if these legalists had gone in for the cross of Christ, they would have been persecuted. And so they don't want to be persecuted. They just want glory. They want glory for themselves. So when you go in for legalism, you're punished. You see, we have here, keep compelling you to be circumcised only to avoid being persecuted from the cross of Christ. First of all, when you go into legalism, you are punished. You're not going to be persecuted for Christ, but you're going to be punished. But when you go in for grace, you'll be tested. Now these believers, and they were believers, were going in for legalism. And they're simply going to be punished. And they were trying to avoid the testing of having somebody say, well, all you did was believe in Christ, you got to do this, that, and the other. Now, if these men who had come down for Jerusalem had gone in for the grace message, they would have been persecuted by their own people, by their own church that they came from. But since they go in for legalism, they wish to avoid the criticism of legalism. And many pastors who know better hop around or tiptoe around or walk on eggshells around the Word of God because they are concerned about criticism. Forget it. You're not worth your salt as a pastor if you're concerned about criticism because you're always going to get it. There's no way around it. And besides, you're going to get it in a legalistic church too. If you're a legalist and you teach legalists, well, they're the best types of people to backbite you. There's no way around uh, avoiding persecution, there, but there is a difference. If you're persecuted for the cross of Christ, it's testing. If you're persecuted on the basis of the fact that you're teaching legalism, it's for punishment. Either way, there's criticism. So let's get a principle out of this. A principle out of Galatians 6.12. Principle. If you live your life to avoid criticism from others, if you live your life to avoid criticism for, from others, you are not living your life as unto the Lord. Again. If you live your life to avoid criticism from others, you are not living your life as unto the Lord. You do not live a life based on principle. You're living a life based on what other people think. Why do young people dress just like all the other young people? They're going on someone else's thought pattern. And oftentimes that thought pattern is absolutely retarded. Wearing pants below the butt and showing your underwear is a sign of retardation. And I don't mean I don't mean IQ wise, I mean retardation in that they don't even they don't understand principle. They're just gonna follow a fad that some rap artist made up who probably is retarded. Oh, he can rhyme here and there, that's the only thing he's ever did in his life. And so they follow this rap artist. That's where it came from, a rap artist. And they follow this rap artist into wearing pants down below the butt. How smart is that? It's stupid. 
But believers do the same thing. And when you go in for legalism because you're tired of the persecution you receive from your friends who are legalistic, you might as well just uh, jack your pants down below your butt and say, I'm retarded, and put a stamp right on your head. I'm retarded and follow what other people do. And this is what Paul is saying, and he's being this tough with them. If you live your life to avoid criticism from others, you're not living your life as unto the Lord. And I'll tell you right now, when I was in high school, I had my own form of dress. I even do today. And I did not dress too dissimilar to the way I dress today. I did not follow the fad. did not care about the fad. Why? I lived a life based on principle. I lived a life based on the Word of God, and you can do it because David did it. Now, if you're going to live your life based on what other, others think, you're a loser. And if you're a young person and you decide you're just going to follow the crowd because it's the cool thing to do, you're a loser. Don't follow what's cool. You follow what God wants, not what people want. What people want is absolutely insane. You follow what God wants. Don't follow the cosmic system. And young people do the stupidest things just because they consider it cool. What for? Why do you want to be cool? It won't last long because soon you'll grow up and realize, well, wasn't that the stupidest stuff I ever did? But what you need to realize right now is you're, you're getting off on the wrong foot if you just follow what you think is cool. If you do things because other people do it and because you think, well, this is the cool route, you're, you're a loser. You're a loser in your spiritual life because you live your life as unto the Lord, not as unto your peers. And peer pressure is the stupidest thing ever. I never went in for peer pressure. If I ever did anything stupid, it's because I want, and I did, but it was because I wanted to do it. No one forced me into it. I just decided, well, I'm, I'm going to do something stupid now, and I decided, and nobody pushed me that way. I just did it. But if you're going to be pushed around, you're like a tumbleweed in the desert, pushed around by the dry winds. And wherever the wind blows, that's where you tumble. And then eventually you tumble into a forest fire out in the west and burn up, sin face to face with death. Why? You never got with principle. And the Bible teaches us principle. And you need to live off of principles. Now David as a teenager lived on principle. And if David could do it in the Old Testament with far less than what you have, you can sure do it. People get away with a lot of things when they're younger because of the fact that they're young. And people say, well, they're just young. They're, they're going to do stupid things. And it's true. And so are old people. But you don't get away with it. And David as a teenager lived on principle. In fact, David as a teenager lived on more principle than his father did Jesse. Jesse was an idiot compared to his son David. Jesse was a moron. David was not. David had more sense in his family than anyone around him as a young teenager. Well, not too young. Uh, maybe from the ages 16 to 18 out there in the field. He knew a hell of a lot more than his mother, his father, and all his brothers and sisters. And why? Because David lived a life on principle. And then when he was promoted, guess what? He was promoted into the castle. One day we'll study David, but not coming up. We're going to study Joseph on Sunday. And we'll study David at some point, maybe after Joseph. But David one time, he got promoted. And he got to go to the castle. And in that castle, there were wild parties. Lots of drinking, lots of having fun, and lots of women everywhere. Now, David later on got dis uh, distracted by that, but not as a young man. And there were a lot of parties, a lot of drinking, and a lot of young women. You know what he did? He took one look at living in that palace, and he said, I don't like this at all. I'm going to separate myself from these people, and I'm going back to live with sheep. All of you want to ask your parents, can I go to this party and that party? Well, maybe not you, but many teenagers do that. Can I go to this party? Can I go to that party? What did David do? Well, guess what Jesse wanted David to do? Jesse wanted David to go to the party. And Jesse said, yeah, man, that's the king. You go to that party. And Jesse said, you stay there with them and you'll get elevated. And he probably got pretty excited. And then when Jesse probably saw David come home, Jesse probably looked at David and said, what an idiot. He was over there in the palace 
and he was about to get me some money and his whole family some money, and now he comes back here. Why did David go back to tend to the sheep? He didn't like that lifestyle. He didn't like the fast crowd. He didn't like doing what other people like to do. You know what he liked? Meditating on the Word of God. And the best place where he could do it was with a bunch of sheep. That's because they didn't bother him except when they went by and went off course. It's the only time they bothered David. But during that time he could meditate on the Word much better than having all those distractions of the drinking and the partying and all that other stuff that was going on in the palace. Now David, of course, later slipped from this, but he had principle as a teenager, and so can you. And if David could have it as a teenager, you can definitely have it as an adult, especially with the unique spiritual life we've been given. So don't just follow people blindly. blindly. You're your own man. If you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And guess what you need to stand for? The Word of God. You need to stand on the rock. You need to stand on the Word of God. Don't go out and stand on the sand where everyone else is living and where you can get swept away by any type of uh, thing that comes along. It's not worth it. Galatians 6.13 Galatians 6.13 For those who are circumcised do not keep the law themselves. Now Paul was giving to them something from a different direction. I just gave you the lascivious side of it. But Paul was giving them the legalistic side of it. And what was happening is all these Galatians were going in for legalism. They had followed grace and they knew that they were saved by grace. But now suddenly they think, well maybe I need to be saved by circumcision. Maybe I need to be spiritual by circumcision. Maybe I need to go back to the law. And this is what they were thinking. But then Paul comes out and says, For those who are circumcised do not keep the law themselves. He's saying, look, these Jews don't even keep the law themselves. And you're following them? You're following a bunch of idiots who can't even keep the law themselves. But they want. And this want in the Greek is from emotion. They're, they're an emotional revolt of the soul, that is the legalist. But they want you to be circumcised so they may boast about your flesh. Now what's happening here is all these legalists want to go back to Jerusalem and they want to brag about how many Gentiles got circumcised. They want to go back and say, when I was in uh, Galatia, all these Gentiles came forward. I counted 350 Gentiles who came forward and got circumcised right before my eyes. And they would all say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! What a bunch of nonsense. If people were doing that today, then probably the law would come arrest them and they probably should because they're nuts. But people in other churches who have people come forward for all different types of nefarious reasons, it's no different. You believe in Christ to be saved. Coming forward is, has nothing to do with it. So legalists boast about the flesh. This is a principle. Write this one down. Legalists boast about the flesh. That is how many people are at their church. That's what they boast about. And they boast about how many people raised their hands when they were given the invitation. How many people came forward. What are they doing? Boasting about energy of the flesh. Boasting about a hand being raised. Boasting about two feet that can get up and walk. Boasting about what? Flesh, flesh, flesh. And that's worthless. So the principle, legalists boast about the flesh. The spiritual boast about grace. And how do you boast about grace? Very simple. You come into contact with an unbeliever and he shows interest in the Word and shows interest in the Gospel. You don't boast about yourself, as I've heard many people do. And they've said, I've, I've witnessed this before. When I went to... A, a symphony camp up in Brevard, North Carolina. Uh, there were some people out on the street and I said, well, I'm going to go over and see what these people have to say. And the guy was talking to an obvious unbeliever, but he wasn't giving the gospel and the guy was obviously interested. But he didn't give the gospel what he say. He said, once I was a young man like you and I like to look at pornography, which was something I didn't want to hear and something nobody needed to know. And then he said, but then I invited Christ into my life and I don't care for pornography anymore. Liar! I bet he is a liar too. 
He, he said that because he's thinking about it. He's just a liar. And that boy didn't get saved because of him. Now he's a young man. And I didn't step in front of him because I knew something about authority. He was older than me and I wasn't going to do it. If I had to do it all over again, I would have done it. So the fact is, uh, here was this guy all interested and the only thing he could talk about is sin. Sin, sin. It's nothing to do with sin. It has to do with the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And then if after you're saved, you go home and look at pornography, you're still saved. So chew on that one. So legalists boast about the flesh. The spiritual boast about grace. The third principle about this well, actually, the second one that I've given you. The second one about this. The legalists are not serving the Lord. They are serving man. And how are they serving man? They love the approbation of man, the approval of man. They love to get patted on the back. They want to go back to Jerusalem and be thought of as the great spiritual giants who had a bunch of Gentiles get circumcised. Woo-hoo. But man will praise it. God doesn't. But they don't care. They don't care if God praises it. They are living in the moment and they are searching for the praise of man. Now in Galatians 6.14, corrected translation, May my purpose never be glory. That's the Apostle Paul talking. May my purpose never be glory. That means that no pastor teacher is worth his salt if he's a glory seeker. If he's seeking the praise of man, he'll never make it. He'll be booted out from church to church. Because people will recognize he's a weak sister. No pastor is worth his salt if he's a glory seeker. It also includes you as believers. If you as a believer are a glory seeker, you're a loser. If you, want, if you live your life in order that man will pat you on the back and tell you how good you're doing, you're a loser. And if you have approbation lust, that's approval lust in any form. It doesn't have to be in the church. You might have approval lust at work. You might want everyone at work to like you. Or you might, you know what you do at work? Just work is unto the Lord. Don't worry about what other people think. And you don't put your foot out or, or try to talk and be sweet to somebody because you think they're a danger to you. You don't think in terms of people. You're not working for people even in a business. You're working for the Lord. No matter what you're doing. You're in school. Somebody talks about you. So what? You're in school. A teacher does something that you don't like to you. So what? You're not studying under a teacher. You're studying under the Lord. Study as unto the Lord. That means you probably need to study harder. Because when you know you're not doing it for a teacher and you know you're doing it for the Lord, well then you'll just begin to understand some things. Maybe a teacher will be unfair to you. So what? They're your authority. Maybe a pastor is unfair to you and you really didn't do anything that he said you did. Maybe you really weren't talking and he just imagined it. It's possible. Well, guess what? doesn't matter. You have to have humility and just move on. And the same thing, and humility is very important, and we will note that with Joseph. One thing Joseph had was humility. And that's the one thing that got him promoted. What was Moses called by God? Not by people, but by God. The most humble man on the face of the earth. All the people were saying, Ah, oh, Moses, he's arrogant. But God looked down and said, No. Moses is the most humble man on the face of the earth and he was promoted straight to being, as it were, king of Israel. He wasn't king. He was their leader, though. He was the one who led them out of slavery. And so God promotes the humble. God promotes the humble believer, but he makes war against the arrogant believer. And so if a teacher does you wrong, don't react. If a boss man does you wrong or a boss woman, don't react. Leave them in the Lord's hands and do your job as unto the Lord. Do your schoolwork as unto the Lord. Maybe you'll join a band. Play your instrument as unto the Lord. Maybe you'll play a sport. Play a sport as unto the Lord. You'll do it a lot better than playing it as unto a coach. And the coach may chew you out for making a bad play. 
Don't get upset your playing is unto the Lord. Maybe your cheerlead is unto the Lord. Don't get upset when somebody's going against you or somebody seems to be too harsh. So what? Your cheerleading is unto the Lord. Sounds goofy, but we're all in full-time Christian service. And everything we do in life, we do it as unto the Lord, not as unto people. And one thing we've got to understand is authority. And if you don't understand the authority of teachers, parents, coaches, whatever, if you don't understand any authority, pastors, if you don't understand it, you'll never make it. But I'll tell you this, you might respect my authority, but if you don't respect the authority of one of your teachers or if you don't respect the authority of one of your bosses, eventually you'll not, you, you won't respect mine either. I'll step on your toes so hard you'll react to me in the same way you reacted to your boss, the same way you reacted to your teacher, the same way you reacted to your coach. Why? You lack authority orientation. Now ask yourself, we've all done it, but just think about it to yourself. How many times have you went against authority and tried to undermine authority because they crossed you? It's about time to put that all aside and know that you're working under an ultimate authority, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I'm telling you is when you book against a boss, when you book against a coach, against a teacher, against a pastor, you're bulking against the Lord because in Colossians it tells you you work is unto the Lord and everything you do is unto the Lord. If you can't handle authority, you will not be able to handle a position of authority as well by way of application. So these legalists, didn't, they were abusing their authority, telling these people what to do in the energy of the flesh. So Paul, as a great leader, he's not abusing his authority. He's chewing them out, but he's not abusing his authority because he's never told them to do these wacky things. He's always told them, look, do it as unto the Lord. And this is what he's going to say here. May my purpose never be glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning the Apostle Paul was doing his own job as unto the Lord. If the Apostle Paul was going to give any glory, it would be to Jesus Christ. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, I am what I am by grace. By whom the world is crucified. May my purpose never be glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified. Separated from me and I to the world. By whom the world of... And this means human good efforts. What's the world try to do for salvation? Human good. What's the world try to do after salvation? Human good. One more time of the translation. My, my, may my purpose never be glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified, separated from me and I to the world. What's the world? The cosmic system. And the world to us would be trying to execute the spiritual life by human good, trying to be saved by human good. And what did the Apostle Paul say about it? He separated himself from it. And Paul is separated from the world. So what we need to note now, since separation has come up many times in Galatians and in the past when we've been studying, and we've went over this before, but it's important to go over it again because I don't remember who was here or who was not. We need to study the doctrine of separation. And since the Apostle Paul separated from the world, you need to understand what separation is all about. And you need to understand that I've never told you to separate from a family member. And I've never told you to separate from your parents or sisters and brothers. I've never told you to do that because there's two types of separations that we must study. And you decide on your own, from your own free will, which road you'll take. So here we are. Separation. And I'll give you the, the Bible verses with all of this so that you can look at it yourself. I'm not making it up. What is separation? Definition. Separation is the technique of switching from personal love to impersonal love. Separation is the technique of switching from personal love to impersonal love when dealing with friends or loved ones in the cosmic system. That includes about the whole world. 
includes about all my family, probably all yours, not to judge, it's just the way the state of things today. And so what you do is you switch from personal love to impersonal love. Now you have, naturally, personal love toward your parents, or usually. Sometimes you may not. And if you don't, maybe you're mad at your parents right now. What do you do? Well, personal love is going to automatically be cut off. Maybe they did something unfair to you, so you cut off personal love. As a believer, and knowing these doctrines, you must move to impersonal love immediately. And love them not on the basis of their character, but on the basis of yours. And that's one example. But you might be all grown up. And maybe you have a fight with your parents. You're grown up now. What do you do? Instead of getting in a squabble and yelling and fighting with each other, switch to impersonal love and love them on the basis of your character and not theirs. That is a system of separation. Now, what do most people do? See, they mess up here. They don't understand impersonal love. So... When personal love fails, when somebody in your family does you wrong or you think they have, you switch to personal hate. And that is the only way that personal love and personal hate are connected. Maybe uh, maybe your mother will say something mean to you. And I'm talking about adult. You're an adult woman and your adult mother says something mean. Usually what happens today is that daughter will go from personal love into reaction and then personally hate her mother. And then, after a while, she will regret it and have a, and feel sorry about it and switch back to personal love. This is weak. And you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What you really need to do is move from personal love. You've been done wrong by anybody. Friends, loved ones, neighbors move to impersonal love. That's separation. It's a form of mental separation. It doesn't always, in fact most times, it doesn't need to be a physical separation. Mental. It's all in your mind anyway. You can separate from somebody and they'll still get on your nerves a hundred miles away. Doesn't matter. I speak from experience. It happens. You can be a thousand miles away from somebody and they can still irritate you and get you out of fellowship. So it's a mental separation. Not to say that the physical separation doesn't help sometimes. It does. And we'll know that too. So I've never told you to physically separate. That's a choice you make on your own. But there must be a mental separation. There must be. There are certain instances where there must be a physical separation, which we will know. So this doctrine involves both establishing the correct priorities of life in order to have mental separation. The only way you're ever going to understand with whom to have a mental separation is to first of all have your priority straight. Make sure your number one priority is Bible doctrine. If your number one priority is Bible doctrine, then you can start making these decisions. But until then, don't even bother because you're probably floundering in the cosmic system with them. In fact, you are if Bible doctrine is not number one. Separation is actually the perception of doctrine by which one establishes his priorities in life. You establish your own priorities in life. And the very fact that you're here tonight and listening to the Word of God, it separates you from the, everyone else who doesn't care. You're already separated mentally. And while they may be at home making fun of you or talking about you because you're sitting here in this small group, so what? That's not the issue anyway. And you're, you're separating yourself from what by sitting here if you're filled with the Spirit? You're separating yourself from the cosmic system. So the application of doctrine is by which one separates or dissociates himself with any hindrance to momentum from friends or loved ones. Friends and loved ones can hold you back. And the mental separation to impersonal love can make it possible where you understand that they're coming from the cosmic system and you just say to yourself, that's their choice, so what? I mentally separate. 
Doesn't mean you can't have a relationship with them or eat chicken with them or anything else. Just means you're mentally separated from all the hostility or whatever they have towards you. And they might nitpick at you and they will. You'll be around the dinner table and suddenly they'll bring up something that's none of their business and poke at you with it and try to rile you up. They want to get you riled up. They want to make you look crazy. Why? They want you to be in the same place they are. Miserable! And they are miserable. And I've seen it happen and everybody has it in the, everyone's family. And they'll sit around and nitpick. Oh, you teach every day, huh? Don't you think that's a little too much? Stab, 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 stab. Try to get you riled up, see? And that hasn't happened to me yet, but with others it has. They won't talk to me. Maybe they're a little too intimidated. I don't know. Or maybe they, they'll talk to others about it. I really haven't had much problems with my family nitpicking me. Maybe they know I'm too smart for them. <laughs> I don't know. So That sounded arrogant. Oh, well. So separation is the perception of doctrine by which one establishes his own priorities in life. And until you've established Bible doctrine as your number one priority, you cannot make a correct decision about separation. I'm going to have to pick up the pace or I won't get through with Galatians today either. So separation has two connotations. You can write this down. There's separation unto, number one. And then number two, there's separation from. Separation unto and separation from. And this just means direction. There's separation unto. And that is the principle of perpetuating your spiritual life. That means you're separating yourself unto doctrine. You've made Bible doctrine number one. You've separated yourself unto doctrine. This is the basis for establishing correct priorities in life. And separation also involves occupation with Christ in that you've separated your mental attitude toward Christ only. Your whole mission in life is to execute the spiritual life and that means you've been separated unto mentally and nobody may never know about it except you yourself and that's fine. Then there's separation from. Separation from is manward. Separation unto is Godward. Separation from is applied to both believers and unbelievers. You should separate from some certain believers and you should separate from certain unbelievers in the cosmic system who desire to influence you to get out of your unique spiritual life. Therefore, there sometimes must be separation from loved ones who reside in the cosmic system. But this does not necessarily mean physical separation. Mainly, it means mental separation. And there are some instances that I will note where physical separation is commanded by the Word. So there are two categories of separation from people. Number one, mental separation. And we'll get a description of this. In mental separation, there is one-way antagonism. That means in mental separation, you are in the divine dinosphere, you're filled with the Spirit, and the people in the cosmic system are going to nitpick at you and stab at you with little needles and try to hurt you. So that's one-way antagonism from the cosmic system toward you, from Satan's system toward you. Now your volition can protect you from such things and in which you do not react and become antagonistic toward them. And when you have impersonal love, what does that mean? You do not react. If you react, you failed. You failed in your spiritual life. Never react to anyone. Look at Moses. He reacted one time, recorded in the Bible. He may have done it more, but there's only one time in which Moses reacted once to a bunch of rebels. And God punished him so severely he almost died of sin face to face with death. Why? Reaction. Don't react. Punishment is involved in reaction because when you react, you begin to talk about the other person who is loaded with sins and God transfers that load of sins they have right onto your head and triples the discipline. Don't bother in reaction. Now we will all react and as soon as we react, do not go into self-justification. Immediately rebound. Immediately. Or you're in danger of the sin face to face with death. So do not react. That's part of mental separation. And we will note the context of Matthew 10, 34 through 38 in a moment. So I'll skip that. 
We by now should simply know that mental separation in contrast to physical separation is a separation in which you avoid this. Let's get this for mental separation. Then we'll move to what physical separation is and the categories that allow physical separation. Mental separation in contrast to physical separation is therefore a separation that avoids maligning. That is to verbalize some things that hurt others. Words that are designed to hurt others. Mental separation in contrast to physical separation is therefore a separation that avoids maligning, judging, hating, criticizing, seeking revenge, hurting those with whom you've been intimate in the past. That doesn't mean sexually intimate. There's intimate relationship between parents and children, brothers and sisters, friends. So mental separation means you avoid the mental attitude sins when it refers to that person and maybe they've done you wrong. In fact, they have. And they've talked about you and they've maligned you and they've had revenge against you. The best way to deal with it is not react and move to impersonal love and therefore you've had a mental separation and they don't have a leg to stand on. And if they think they still have a leg to stand on after you move to impersonal love, God will squish them like, a, uh, like grapes, like the Israelite women do with grapes when they're making wine. God will smush you if God will smush the one who, because if you move from personal love to impersonal love with this person and they continuously attack you, you, as it were, have left it in the Supreme Court of Heaven and it's open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year and he will smash that person into little bits, if not kill them. You see, revenge is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Don't seek revenge on your own. You're only stepping in the way of God. You're actually being arrogant. When you seek revenge on your own, you are displaying the greatest arrogance ever by saying, God, step out of the way. I'll handle this set situation. And God says, oh, you think you will, do you? And then you get a spanking along with everyone else. So mental separation not only emphasizes integrity and honor, but perpetuates modus operandi inside your unique spiritual life and therefore avoids distractions. You're always going to have distractions no matter where you move. You might move to Alaska where nobody's around you. You might be listening to a tape and you hear a bear scratch at your door. Then you get pissed off at the bear and angry. It's, 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 it's not a person, but you're still angry. You can't even get angry toward animals. Now, you can blow them away, but you blow them away with impersonal love. Take that gun barrel just the way it is in war. If you go to war, you blow away the enemy with impersonal love. You don't have any feelings of hatred toward the enemy. You just, you're a professional fighter, and the greatest professional fighters are believers. Why? Because they can have impersonal love. And that enemy's been shooting at you and they've been killing your friends and you don't go off into hatred because your friends have laid their dead. They're doing a job like you are. So what do you do? You impersonally love the enemy and blow his head off. And that's a principle. It sounds crazy, but it's a principle of warfare because it's part of the Bible that we should protect our freedom. And you don't have any feelings of hatred toward the man you're blowing away. You're just glad you got him before he got you. Impersonal love. And that's the way it is in uh, warfare, and, but not the way it is for us in living in peace over here for now. So let's look at physical separation. There are a few cases where switching from personal love to impersonal love will not work, but just a few. For example, you receive false information from a local church you must physically leave that church. You can't hang around that church. A church that gives false doctrine, you must physically leave. 
But when you leave, leave with the concept of impersonal love. Don't leave in hatred. And you must physically leave them because they'll distract you. And when you leave, walk out of that church with your mouth zipped and go on to wherever you want to go. And you have to leave with impersonal love. If you leave and you get hate and you have hatred about it and you're leaving just because you're mad, well you're out of fellowship. And you'll justify it. You'll say, well, they don't teach the word. But you're still supposed to leave with impersonal love. You, with by your own choice, sat in that church. And you, by your own choice, can get up and walk out. It's kind of like television. They don't make you watch one channel. If you're getting mad at a channel, why sit there and watch it? Although we all do that if we're watching the news or something. Some idiot's on there talking about uh, the war or something else and you don't agree with it and you get mad at him and you keep on watching him. What for? waste of time. He can't hear you anyway, yelling at the TV. I've done it, but he can't hear me. A second reason for leaving. When a woman is used by a punching bag by her husband, she should separate. And the reason is very clear. When a woman is used as a punching bag by her husband, she should separate. Leave. Get out. And the most basic reason is to avoid the compromise of doctrine in your soul. Because here's this man in authority and he's brutalized you. And you have to respond to that man anyway. But no, you don't. You can leave. But if you stay with him, you're going to have to respond to that man anyway and it's going to make it all the harder for you to respond to any type of Bible doctrine. Because if a woman is beaten by a husband, she must respond to... It will make it nearly impossible for her to respond to any authority of doctrine because she'll associate the pastor with her husband beating her because the pastor has to get tough. Now, I'm never going to beat anybody. pastor's not to be a striker of persons. I never will be unless I'm struck first. That's just self-defense. But it becomes nearly impossible for a woman to respond to the authority of doctrine unless she separates from a brutal, vicious, evil husband is that. Any man who beats on a woman is brutal, vicious, and evil. Absolutely. One of the most basic things I learned as a child, do not hit a woman. Physical separation means to avoid any personal contact with a person under any circumstances. That means if you decide to have physical separation with someone, they're dead to you. They better be dead to you. That means never again the line is separated and they are dead. And they might as well be dead. So when you make that choice, make sure you know in your mind that that person's dead to you. Same with divorce. If you get a divorce, make sure the person you divorced is dead to you. Don't go crawling back. It's not going to work. So this separation means severance of all relation with that person of any kind. All relations. Severance. Physical separation is sometimes needed to maintain one's priorities and to use one's volition to remain inside the unique spiritual life. And usually the physical separation is related to those under authority and not to those in authority because those under authority, maybe your husband will become a bully and say, don't go to that church anymore. That's none of his business. Don't go to church and don't learn doctrine. Many husbands have done that. They've gotten jealous of the doctrinal teacher and said, don't go there anymore. That requires a physical separation because doctrine is more important. It does not allow you to get remarried, however, not in that case. And we've studied that before. And in the case of getting beaten, it does not allow you remarriage. It just allows you regular divorce. And you cannot get remarried until that guy goes off and gets married himself. And then if he does, he's broken the bond and you're free. So physical separation is to... Keep one's priority straight. The only reason you should ever physically separate from anyone is so that you can keep your priorities straight. 
And when it can be done mentally, do it. But when it comes to positions of authority like separating from a pastor teacher that you don't like, separate and don't say a word about it. So the principle is this. In most cases, the separation should be merely a mental separation. In most cases, the separation should be merely a mental separation. However, in cases where violence is involved, in cases where violence is involved, there should be total physical separation. And believers get involved in violence. I'm well aware of that. All of us at some point have been involved in violence, whether as a child or as an adult. And when you get violently involved with a friend, violently involved with uh, your family, well then it's time for physical separation. There's no place for violence in the spiritual life. So in the case where violence is involved, there should be total physical separation. Now, if you're beaten as a child, and I mean beaten, I don't mean spanking. I mean if you're beaten, bloody, and you have bones broken, etc., you've got a whole different problem on your hands that relates to child abuse, which we've studied before. And in that case, there's a whole different set of rules that uh, I'm not going to go into. It'd take too long. So let's look at some scripture of separation. We might just have to carry on till Sunday or maybe I can finish quick enough here. I'll just go over these scriptures. You can turn there if you're fast. If you, can, if you have a fast finger, go ahead. 2 Timothy 3.5 They, that's believers and unbelievers in the cosmic system, they hold to external forms of godliness but have renounced the power of that same godliness, referring to the spiritual life, you also be turning yourself away from these men. Turn yourselves away mentally. That means don't go to the church where they're teaching false doctrine. Second Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, believers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you separate from every believer who leads an undisciplined life. That means separate from every believer who does not take in the word of God consistently. Not physically. If we were to physically separate from every believer that did that, we'd be the only people talking to each other. It's mental separation. Now, and that, that second uh, Thessalonians 3, 6, Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you separate from every believer who lives an undisciplined life, no momentum in the spiritual life, that is not according to the tradition you have received from us. The, tr the tradition received from Paul was daily Bible study. 2 Thessalonians 3.14 If anyone does not... Oh, 2 Thessalonians 3.14 If anyone does not obey our doctrinal teaching in this epistle, take special note of that person and do not associate with him so that he may be put to shame. And that is not by you. He'll be put to shame at the Bema. And separate from such a people who do not uh, take interest in doctrinal teaching. Mentally. Again, physical separation deals with violence and with churches. And that's it. Romans 16, 17 through 18. Now I urge you, royal family, to keep your eyes on those who create dissensions and occasions for stumblings contrary to the doctrine that you learned. In fact, avoid them. For such are slaves, not to our Lord Christ. That was just like the Galatians. Not slaves to Jesus Christ, but slaves to a bunch of legalistic rules. But their emotions, by their smooth talk and flattery, flattery, they deceive the stupid. The stupid lack Bible doctrine, that's why they're deceived. And you must have mental separation in order that you do not become stupid. And sometimes in very critical cases, such as being in a church that does not teach doctrine, physical separation. And not one foot in a legalistic church and one foot in a grace church. Both feet in one or the other. And we study that in Galatians. So turn away from them in Romans 16, 17 through 18. It's actual physical separation from troublemakers, oftentimes who become violent. Separation is necessary because of the cosmic system. Romans 12, 1 through 12, 3. Romans 12, 1 through 12, 3. Separation is necessary because of the cosmic system. 
Therefore I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, that's referring to rebound, which is your reasonable service. Stop being conformed to this world, the arrogant skills, but be transformed by the renovation of your thought through the spiritual skills, that you may prove what the will of God is, the divine good production, the well-pleasing, that is to fulfill the unique spiritual life, the well-pleasing to God and the mature status quo. For I say through the grace which has been given to me to everyone who is among you, stop thinking of self in terms of arrogance beyond what you ought to think. When you move into personal hatred, you're arrogant. And you're thinking beyond what you ought to think because you think you have a right to hate, to be mad. But think in terms of sanity. For the purpose of being rational without illusion, as God has assigned to each believer a standard of thinking from doctrine. So if you fail in the matter of separation, you will think of self in terms of arrogance. Now we also have separation from unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 6.14, and this deals with marriage along with business. Separation from unbelievers in marriage as well as business. That is, do not take a business partner who is an unbeliever, that is, sharing halves in your company. Do not become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? You ladies run into a handsome young man who's an unbeliever, and you're a believer, even a carnal believer, you still have no relationship with lawlessness. Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? None. And what agreement does Christ have with Beliar? Dealing with uh, the gods of the old. Or what does a believer share in common with an unbeliever? And what mutual agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Remember, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit indwell each and every one of us. We are the temple of the living God, just as God said. I will live in them and will walk among them, referring to Old Testament. In the Old Testament, he walked among them. In the New Testament, he lives in us. A big difference. And I will be their God and they will be my people. This is prophecy, and it's referring to the fact that he was the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he walked with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's the God of us in the church age, and he lives in us far greater. Therefore, come out from their midst, unbelievers, and be separate. Doesn't mean you can't talk to unbelievers, of course. That's ridiculous. It's talking about partnership, talking about corporations, and marriage is a corporation. You as a believer have no business getting married to an unbeliever, and if you do... Hell will break loose shortly thereafter. And then you got to stay with them. It's part of God's sense of humor. All right, you wanted that so bad, you get to stay with them now. And you can't leave unless they leave first. Isn't God funny? Yes, he is. He has a wonderful sense of humor. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you. So every time you hook up with someone who's in the cosmic system, you become a partner with the cosmic system. And this is why you're given the order, therefore, come out from among them. Separation is also important in social life. You might simply hang around one church because you like your social life. Wrong. Jeremiah 15, 16 through 17. Jeremiah 15, 16 through 17. Now one thing you have to understand about Jeremiah is he was very gregarious. He loved social life. He was very popular before he became a prophet. He was very popular before he started teaching these doctrines. And he loved parties. And he loved hanging out. And this is why in 1516 through 1517 he has some things to say. And then following that he actually complains about it. But we'll just get the principle. 1516, your words were discovered and I metabolized them. King James, your words were discovered and I ate them. And then there's idiots eating the Bible. No, it has to do with learning the word. Your words were discovered and I metabolized them. Therefore, your doctrines became happiness to me and the delight of my heart. That is because I belong to you. I did not, now this is the separation, social separation from the fast crowd the lascivious crowd, 
social separation from those young people under 21 who like to go out and raise hell and drink and all that. Social separation from those people. You must. I did not spend my time in the company of other people laughing and having a good time. Nothing wrong with laughing and having a good time, but these were the wrong people to laugh and have a good time with. These were hell raisers. I stayed to myself because I felt obligated to you. To who? God. I stayed to myself because I felt obligated to you and because I was filled with anger at what they had done and what had they done. Rejected doctrine. And so anger here is more of righteous indignation and Jeremiah had a righteous indignation toward the people of his day because they did not care for the word. So what did he do? He separated from them. And he separated them from them to the extent that not only did he not go to their parties, he did not go to their funerals. And people said, oh, that Jeremiah, he's really insulting us. He tells us our country's going over, going under, and now he doesn't even have the decency to come to a funeral with us when my father's died. And I remember I used to hang out with Jeremiah. Now he's not here anymore. And why is he not here? He's separated from you people who are soon going to go under the fifth cycle of discipline. And he should have. And it saved him a lot of heartache to do it before the fifth cycle. He even missed out on his right woman because she was going the wrong way. And God said, no, you can't have her. And he says, just as you can't have your woman, your right woman, Israel will no longer be a right woman to me. And boom, Israel was wiped out. And they went into captivity. And people thought so much of social life and they thought so much of the protocol of going to funerals, of doing this, that, and the other and following protocol and they were out of line. They should have been following Jeremiah and doctrine. And if they had followed Jeremiah and doctrine, he would have went to their funerals and he would have had a social life with them. But he was not going to mess with a bunch of losers. And if you mess with losers, you'll become a loser yourself. And Jeremiah understood it as much as he did not like doing this. And he even mentions it in the following verses if you ever want to look them up. Jeremiah 15, 16 through 17, 18 and following, he starts to complain to God. That's because he went into reversionism for a moment and got right back out of it. So the believer is to separate from a superficial social life. That is a social life in which you're running with the fun crowd, the party crowd, the ones who like to raise hell, get drunk, do drugs. Separate from them people. And if you do not, you're on the wrong track and you will be a loser. The party crowd always has a false scale of values. So the believer is to separate from the fast crowd. So that's part of that. And we know Matthew 10, 34 through 38. Turn there and then we'll finish up with Galatians. Matthew 10, 34 through 38, dealing with separation. And I like this one because it's our Lord Jesus Christ stating it himself. The letters will be in red. You don't like the black and white letters? Well, here's red or black letters. Well, here's red. Here's our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, the sweet Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, 34 through 38. Do not presume, this is where most people go off the wrong track, they presume what Jesus Christ is all about. And they don't even know Him. Do not presume that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. That is the cross is the basis of spiritual warfare. It divides the human race. And there is a sword between those who believe and those who don't. And there is a sword between those who love doctrine and love the word and those who don't. And Jesus Christ created this sword. Do not presume that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the member of his own household. Why? 
Because some will go for doctrine and some will not. You're very lucky if a whole family goes for doctrine. I'm lucky in that area. Well, graced out, no such thing as luck. I've been graced out in that area. But if you have a whole family going in for doctrine, you've been graced out. But the sword still comes down somewhere. Comes down between grandmother, grandfather. Comes down between brothers, sisters. And that's the sword. The sword of what? Separation. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. Does that sound sweet? No. Then in 37, whoever loves, this is phileo, and this is referring to personal love, right here, personal love. Whoever loves, personal love, father or mother more than me, that is no occupation with Christ, is not worthy of me. Is not worthy of me means that uh, they will not receive the rewards. And you're not, even though you believed in him, you're not worthy of him. And even though you're saved, you're not worthy to be saved as if any of us are. But this is a way our Lord Jesus Christ could tell us we're separated. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross, take up his cross is what? Impersonal love. Whoever does not mentally separate with impersonal love is not worthy of me. So how are you going to live with a bunch of people where Christ has set a sword between you? Impersonal love. And if you find it impossible to have impersonal love, physical, impersonal love plus physical separation, sometimes necessary. And that's, that's up to you and it's your own choice. I'm never ever going to tell you whom you should associate with. That's your business. And it gets cultish if I tell you you can't hang with so-and-so. That's your business. If you want to hang around with a gossip maligner and judger, go for it. They'll take your crown. It's not any of my business. I got mine. So separation also means personality change. We won't go into that. And also, the believer is to separate from violence and criminal activity. That's Proverbs 1, 10 through 19. <clears throat> we won't go over it, but you can look it up. This is where the believer is to separate from violence and criminal activity. Proverbs 1, 10 through 19. It's tempting to get into that. I'll be done in a second. It's, I know you're hurting. Sorry. Uh, but... Uh, Proverbs 1, 10 through 19, you might get into criminal activity, you might get into violence, and it might be tempting to do so uh, because someone's crossed you in such a way, you have a vitriolic hatred and you want to hurt them. We've all been to the point where we probably wanted to murder somebody, it's true, but we got to separate ourselves from that. Now to Galatians 6, 15 through 18, and we'll finish Galatians. For neither circumcision nor uncircumcis uncircumcision is anything. The only thing that matters is a new spiritual species. We've been made a new spiritual species. We're the royal family of God and circumcision doesn't give us that and neither does anything else. Now in 6.16, And all believers who walk in accordance with this canon, with this book, soul prosperity beyond them. Not riches, but soul prosperity beyond them. And mercy also on the Israel of God. Now why all of a sudden does he throw up Israel of God while he's been talking about uh, not uh, following the law? The reason why is because Paul did not want to seem to encourage anti-Semitism. He did not want the, Gal the Galatians to become anti-Semitic from his harsh uh, rhetoric against the Jews. So he's only critiquing the saved yet legalistic Jews, but he's not critiquing the whole Jewish race. That's why he said it, so that no one has any way to go in for anti-Semitism which is against God. From now on let no one give me any static meaning don't talk to me about this anymore for I carry the marks of Jesus on my body. This is an idiom of the day carrying the marks of Jesus on his body. He didn't actually beat himself and make marks and people didn't beat him although they did but those weren't the marks of Jesus. It's an idiom of the day it's when Roman army recruits were branded after providing formidable after providing that they were fit for duty. In the same way they do it in the Air Force, they take a pin or something else and jab it into your uh, chest and it makes a permanent scar. And what Paul is saying, I have been branded in the work of Christ 
Paul is saying, I'm now in the army of the Lord and I've been proven as such and I've been marked as such. Meaning he is the highest of apostles and has been marked as such. 618, royal family of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ with your human spirit. Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ is with our human spirit and he is in us along with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and that is the benediction. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.